From Times Square in Hong Kong, you're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. Rare are the occasions when Western media and Chinese state media are all reporting the same story, and the story they're reporting is good news on both sides of the world. Well, as we talk about the two Michaels returning home to Canada, Meng Huazhou is also back at her home. She and Ms. Meng Huazhou earlier expressed her gratitude to China, right, saying she won't be getting her freedom without We're the great motherland. Right now of Meng Huazhou waving to the crowds as she is uh, departing the plane that took her and from also, Vancouver. And um, also, at the scene, I see uh, the uh, some medical workers in their protective gears. They have bunches of flowers. Uh, I, I believe they are red roses. But that's exactly what happened last weekend, when two passenger jets on opposite sides of the world, one in Canada and one in mainland China, took off on the same day and flew some very high-profile passengers back to their homelands. Meng's nearly three-year U.S. extradition fight ended as she was met at the airport in Shenzhen with a veritable hero's welcome. In a grand style, a crowd of supporters lining the tarmac, welcoming Meng with cheers, music, again, that red carpet. After more than a thousand days of suffering, I finally returned to my home country. The long wait in a foreign land was very torturous. China, I am back. The story itself has its origins here, in Hong Kong. But over the past three years, it's entangled law enforcement, lawyers and governments of China, the United States and Canada, and led to multi-billion dollar trade sanctions, top-level diplomatic bargaining, and the patriotic celebration in China that has galvanized the nation. I'm Simei Shen, a journalist on the tech desk here at the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. Before we start this week, let me take you back, briefly, to December and our episode on Huawei and Meng Wanzhou. If I ask you to use just one word, how would you describe what you have witnessed in the past two years with the Meng Wanzhou case? Circus, sideshow, or saga? Oh, it's definitely a saga. I mean, this is uh, this story um, kind of puts Vancouver at the cutting edge of the biggest story of the past half century, which is the rise of China and how the rest of the world confronts the rise of China. And what we see in Meng Wanzhou and her arrest and her attempted prosecution by uh, the Americans, I think is the embodiment of that great clash. That's King Ling Lo speaking with Ian Yang, the Vancouver-based member of our newsroom who has been following this story every step of the way for the past three years. The saga of Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels may have ended last weekend, but you're going to hear from Ian about the uncomfortable truths and the questions that remain unanswered, as well as how this has fundamentally changed the relationship between Canada and China. And you're also going to hear from Tech Desk editor Zhou Xin about how the Beijing government and state media have managed this story and what has happened to Huawei, the telecommunications company at the center of this story. Welcome to the Inside China podcast. Let's get Vancouver on the line. Ian, you've spent three years covering the ongoing extradition proceedings for Meng Wanzhou. Did you have any inkling or uh, background information before last week that this deal was about to be signed, or uh, was it a complete surprise? It wasn't a complete surprise. It was a bombshell, but <laughs> at the same time, uh, you know, at the end of last year, there were whispers that there were there, that there could be a deferred prosecution agreement in the works. A few weeks ago, more discussions about a deferred prosecution agreement. The really surprising part of this, to me, is that. It, in next month or soon thereafter, we were going to get a ruling on extradition from the judge here. So what I find surprising is that Meng Wanzhou would throw out the possibility of that because there was a chance she might have been let go. But she she let that go and she signed this deal instead of um, waiting for the ruling from the judge. The ruling from the judge could have let her go anyway, could have let her go scot-free, but instead she chose to sign this agreement uh, with the Americans and go home now. Having said that, It's a very good agreement for her. It's a very generous agreement for her. China's foreign ministry spokesperson, Hua Chunying, commented that this was 
an incident of political persecution against the Chinese citizen and that there were materials that are sufficient to prove Ms. Meng's innocence. Uh, can you take us through exactly what Meng Wanzhou and the U.S. Justice Department have agreed to here? Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, a deferred prosecution agreement usually involves admissions of wrongdoing and pledges of future cooperation. That's what the U.S. Justice Department did, for instance, with HSBC when it hit them with a massive you know, $1.9 billion fine uh, and pledged them to future cooperation. But with Meng Wanzhou, she's agreed to admit to wrongdoing, to having been untruthful to HSBC, et cetera, et cetera. But she has pledged no further cooperation. So uh, if she abides by the terms of this agreement, at the end of next year, December 1, 2022, the charges against her are dropped. So from in that respect, it's it, it's a generous deal for her. She gets to go home and, you know, no criminal conviction, no charges, no fine, no, nothing. But at the same time, there is this very inconvenient document where she admits to being untruthful to HSBC. HSBC. She admits uh, she knows why she was being untruthful to HSBC. She admits that Huawei was in breach of US sanctions on Iran, and she admits that, um, that by virtue of that, HSBC was also put in breach of US sanctions on Iran. So this document, it's significant, but the problem for the US is they don't get to use it against Meng Wanzhou because of the deal. The deal prohibits its use uh, and the charges are basically dropped uh, if she abides by the deal. That's not to say though, that this evidence couldn't be used against Huawei or that it couldn't be used against Meng Wanzhou if she breaks the deal. What was the most significant change that influenced this deal? Um, is it the change in U.S. presidential administration or the change in Meng Wanzhou's legal team? No, I don't think it's from Meng Wanzhou's legal team. I think that this is a pretty good deal for her. Um, politically, obviously, you know, with, with with a new man in the White House, we've got a, a Joe Biden who might be interested in resetting relations with China. Uh, I think that's very significant because even though both the Chinese side and the Americans have said, oh, this is not a prisoner swap. This is not a related issue. You know, th these two outcomes were arrived at independently. That's kind of ridiculous. I mean, clearly the fact that these, uh, the, the, the two Michaels, Michael Kovig and Michael Spavor and Meng Wanzhou took off from their respective airports at almost exactly the same time shows very clearly that these cases are related and that a quid pro quo was done here. I just find it impossible to believe that this deal would have been granted to Ms. Meng, allowing her to return home without at least some sort of understanding from the Chinese that they were also going to let the two Michaels go as they did. And can I quote one of your recent tweets on this particular subject? You said both the US and China insist that uh, the cases of Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels were resolved independently. Both positions, in my humble opinion, are equally preposterous. Uh, could you tell us a bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's in the political interests of, um, you know, uh, the, the Chinese government and the American government to, sh to, to try to claim that this is their versions of rule of law, that these are cases that are being handled independently of politics. But this case has been intensely political from the get-go, from the very start. And certainly, once China arrested the two Michaels, it was a political case, and that it was almost impossible to believe that a resolution to Meng's case was not going to come simultaneous or very close to simultaneous with a resolution of the two Michaels cases. That was the, um, and that appears to be the purpose of their having been having been seized, you know, even without looking at the merits of the, of, of the so-called espionage case, the very fact that they were, you know, they, they took off at, at, at almost exactly the same time, if not the exact same time that Meng Wanzhou lifted off from Vancouver's airport. Ian, do you think there is a significance of the timing of this deal, um, both the release of Meng Wanzhou and the two Canadians? They came just days after the Canadian election and one week before China's National Day? Yeah, I don't know about National Day. I mean, I think Meng Wanzhou um, alluded to that. I mean, she, she gave a very patriotic message uh, when she was in the air heading towards China and she referred to National Day as a celebration. Um, I think that it's also possible, though, that uh, the Americans held off on this deal uh, uh, so as not to be seen to be influencing the Canadian election, which took place um, uh, five days earlier. Uh, so, yeah, that's the, the timing is possible. But then again... Who knows? You know, the, it, it could just be that the, the political winds were right 
uh, everything lined up, all the ducks were in a row, and they went for it as uh, as, as soon as possible. It, it, it's impossible to say without having had a, a, an ear to the wall when they were uh, putting this deal together. We have covered the nationalist celebration that accompanied her return to Shenzhen quite extensively. And also there's the romantic narrative. But you're in the position to observe what Meng Wanzhou had to say in Canada before her departure. How did that contrast with her comments when she landed in Shenzhen? Well, it was very interesting. I mean, obviously, when Meng Wanzhou heads back to China, she's going to, uh, you know, express her patriotism and uh, and her happiness and her pride at being home. But when she was on the steps of the BC Supreme Court uh, in front of me, in you know, in front of this big crowd of people, uh, she was heaping praise on the Canadian government, for instance, uh, for following rule of law on the Canadian judge, um, you know, Associate Chief Justice Heather Holmes for being uh, being very fair to her. She even praised the Canadian Crown lawyers who had been um, basically uh, de facto prosecuting this case, representing the United States in court. So it's quite interesting, the different tone. And she also thanked the Canadian people uh, for their patience. So this was a pretty well-crafted message, I think, uh, designed for the domestic audience here in Canada, as as was her, her, her message in, in uh, Shenzhen, uh, crafted for a domestic audience back in China. Your reporting from the courtroom over the past years has brought us some fascinating details, but it was your experience outside of Meng Wanzhou's home that was really eye-opening. Uh, can you tell us some of your experiences and the things that you found out about the conditions of her so-called home detention? Well, I mean, I think that um, one of the things that was most focused upon by people here in Canada who were very, very uh, keen to get the two Michaels home, I can't overstate that, that uh, Meng Wanzhou's case really was seen through the prism of the two Michaels, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavel here in Canada. So there was a big contrast between the way that the two Michaels were being held in Chinese prisons, you know, in three metre by three metre cells. I think Michael Kovrig said that his lights were on 24 hours a day and it really wasn't a very pleasant experience compared to Meng Wanzhou's experience, which was that she was living in um, a $14 million mansion, a $14 million mansion that she owned in Vancouver. Uh, She was basically free to come and go as she pleased from that home um, within the limits of a curfew, a late night curfew. Uh, She had visits from a private masseuse. She had visits from an art teacher. She could go out to restaurants. Uh, She could go out, you know, she went on private shopping trips to high-end couture stores here in Vancouver. Um, But at the same time, she did have this GPS tracker strapped to her ankle. So even though this, this is a gilded cage that she was in, but it was still a cage, you know. She she had this GPS tracker strapped to her ankle. Uh, she was surrounded by uh, private security guards 24 hours a day who were designed to prevent her from, uh, from escaping, basically. They were acting as agents of the court. So it was a really interesting situation that we have this powerful and rich woman living in very uh, luxurious circumstances in the most exclusive neighbourhood in Vancouver, just a couple of doors down, incidentally, from the US Consul General's house. Uh, So that was a very interesting contrast to the circumstances of the two Michaels and also, you know, to her circumstances. She wasn't allowed to leave. She was being restrained. Ian, could you tell us a bit more about uh, what the two Michaels said after they returned to Canada, uh, has there been re- much reviewed about the conditions they were in in China? Yeah, they haven't talked, they haven't talked too much about what, what actually went on there. They're obviously very happy to get home. Uh, Michael Kovrig, though, has given a brief interview on television uh, in which he thanked everyone um, uh, for, for being allowed to come home and, and um, you know, thank the government for working tirelessly to get him back here. Uh, you know, was, was telling, though, some of the scenes we saw um, you know, we saw Michael Kovrig bending down on his hands and knees and kissing the tarmac uh, when he arrived in, in Calgary, for instance, in the pre-dawn. Uh, it was a very different reception, though, to the reception that Meng Wanzhou received. You know, Meng Wanzhou was res- uh, literally red carpet for her. There was, um, you know, hours of, of live coverage on state television. Uh, you know, a 550-metre skyscraper was lit up saying, welcome home, Meng Wanzhou. The two Michaels arrived back home in Canada, um, you know, under cover of darkness in Calgary. Uh, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, was there to welcome them, but there was no there was no band, there was no parade, there was nothing like that. 
Um, I think Canadians in general are very happy to have them home. And, and you know, I've, I've, I've spoken to his, to Michael Kovrig's, um, his, his wife in the past, and and there was this sort of palpable uh, desperation from her to, to, to get her husband back. And uh, from what I've seen on television, what I've seen online, she looks incredibly happy. On this podcast back in December last year, you said this case has put Canada on the forefront of the rise of China and the clash with other nations dealing with its rise. How has this changed the relationship between the two countries, do you think? Vastly, irrevocably. I don't, uh, I don't know if, if, if China's relations with Canada can ever go back to being the same. Um, the, the way that this unfolded um, uh, stunned people here. I think, and uh, I think that you know the, the government now faces some very tough decisions, particularly in relation to Huawei uh, and the decision about whether or not to allow them to um, to help build Canada's five G networks. Now that the two Michaels are back, it's possible that Canada will not face the same sort of pressures not to antagonise China. Uh, it may be, you know, it may. Have, having seen that China is willing to play hardball, and um, you know that that it can act uh, in the way it did with the two Michaels, it may be tempted to um, to take a tough line and to join its five eyes five eyes allies, the US and the UK and Australia, for instance, in banning Huawei from the five G networks. On the other hand, it could see this as an opportunity to reset. But uh, for the moment, relationship the relationship is so poor. The perception of China in among the Canadian public is incredibly poor. You know, the, there's a very low um, tolerance, I think, uh, for uh, for the Chinese government here in Canada, and I think that's going to weigh very, very heavily on the Trudeau government. How do you think this case has impacted upon Canadians' perception of China, or this sort of growing anti-Asian sentiment? Uh, that was prevalent during COVID. Yeah, well, that's the thing. This case has coincided for part of it, at least, uh, with the pandemic. And there was a rise in anti-Asian sentiment and anti-Asian incidents and racism uh, that can sort of be um, drawn back directly to the pandemic. And there are already tensions here in Vancouver, for instance, over the role of Chinese money and Chinese wealth on unaffordability. So there are already these sort of tensions. And you know, throw the Meng Wanzhou case into the mix and that sort of could be seen to exacerbate it. I don't want to overstate it. But for instance, you could see it outside the front of the court sometimes uh, when there were these dueling protests. We had um, uh, quite China, quite pro Meng Wanzhou Chinese nationalist type protesters out there waving Chinese flags, for instance. The other, On the other side, we had people who were very strongly critical of Meng Wanzhou and very strongly critical of Huawei and the Chinese government shouting back. You know, and also added to the mix, don't forget, we've got a huge Hong Kong community here as well. And so we had all the tensions that were surrounding, um, you know, the, the pro-democracy protest movement in Hong Kong and the and the mainland Chinese pushback against that being manifested on the streets here. So it, it was quite a potent mix. And, uh, you know, the, the Meng Wanzhou case certainly added to that. So, Ian, can we ask about how this case has impacted your personal life? This has been kind of uh, the end to a three year journey. Yeah, it's been a usually impactful story for me, you know, because um, I've kind of lived and breathed this case for three years. Um, you know, I've covered every uh, every hearing, I've read every piece of evidence, I've heard every piece of witness testimony, and you know, I've written over 130 stories on Mung Wan Jo. You know, I think uh, quite a few of them on Friday. So this was a hugely uh, significant part of my professional life. And it's kind of strange for it all to be over. And it really it unfolded so quickly in that, on, that, on that final day. It was quite unusual to feel it all snowballing and all escalating. And, and then, you know, it, it, I'm sure there'll be plenty to talk about in the future. But basically, this case is over. And this has big, been a big part of my life that's over too. Meng Wanzhou isn't in jail. Meng Wanzhou hasn't been convicted of anything, no. But they do have this uh, series of admissions um, that could easily be used against Huawei in the future if, if, if the US gets that opportunity. Ian, on behalf of our readers and our team here in Hong Kong, thank you. Thanks, Yunmai. It's been a pleasure. As critical news stories emerging from China continue to shape lives and business around the world, the weekly SCMP Global Impact Newsletter brings you expert analyses and insights on the economics of COVID-19, society, technology, and the environment. 
Sign up to receive your weekly email at scmp.com slash newsletters. Josin, we've heard some of how Meng Wanzhou was greeted upon her return. Could you give us an idea of how big a deal this was in Chinese state media and on Chinese social media? Okay, thanks, Yumei. This is really big. I, in my memory, I can't find any like similar uh, event that can match uh, the, the, the enthusiasm for Meng Wanzhou's return. You know, it's on Saturday, later Saturday uh, evening. Yeah, but this is uh, being the live broadcast being on for hours even uh, before the airplane landed, and uh, thousands or tens of thousands of people just uh, tracking the route of the plane. You know, this uh, this is really really huge. And then we send uh, our colleague, of course, uh, Yu Jie, to the Shenzhen airport, and then there are spontaneously, you know, there are thousands of people, you know, with their banners, with flowers, and shouting slogans, singing patriotic songs. At the Shenzhen airport, even they are not allowed to access uh, the tarmac with uh, the airplane landed. So it's it's really really something that is extraordinary. And also, the state television CCTV uh, provides live coverage and the live broadcasting. And at its peak, uh, when the moment um, basically Meng Wanzhou step out of the the airplane and go down the red carpet uh, staircase and deliver a short speech, it was like nearly 100 million people watching at the same time. So this is really Really, really huge, and uh, I think this is not only a uh, kind of uh, um, government arranged kind of event. It also seriously reflects some uh, genius feelings among the Chinese public. Why was this event considered so important to um, Chinese nationalism and so focused on by Chinese state media? Uh, what does Meng Wanzhou represent in China's national consciousness? Well, this is a very interesting question because in the very Chinese media setting, this case has been set up as uh, from the very beginning as it is uh, the Americans uh, and with its ally or with its running dog Canada, the joining hands trying to contain the development of China. And Huawei is, of course, uh, China's uh, uh, you know one of the best technology companies. And then Meng Wanzhou is like the, this is a Chinese daughter, you know, being snatched away by these evil capitalists and evil empirists. They want to. Uh, the bend China's knee uh, through the kidnapping or uh, hostage uh, of uh, Meng Wanzhou. And now with this powerful Chinese government, with the powerful motherland, the daughter is finally freed from these evil hands. And you, you can imagine like how this is uh, symbolic for China's rise and the relative decline of the uh, Western powers. So it fits into a very... Uh, uh, nicely into this narrative that uh, you know the, the the East is rising and the West is in decline, and also this also lent further kind of sense of pride to the uh, Chinese public. You know, no matter who 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 you are, no matter where you are, and as long as you have the backing of the of the Chinese government of the Chinese state, uh, you will always be looked after. You know, this is a message that is, of course, whether it's true or not is another matter, but at least this is a message that is widely accepted on Chinese internet. Also, China's. Ambassador to Canada, Tsong Pei Wu, said her return was a symbol of state power. Uh, what did he mean by that? Well, yes, uh, because from the very beginning, you can see that the whole uh, event, the whole return of Hmong is highlighted as a government uh, or a state act instead of a corporate uh, event. You can see the Xinhua in the morning, you know, uh, at about half past 10, issued its first statement confirming the release of Hmong. And it said, the first line is saying, thanks for re- relentless efforts uh, by the Chinese government, you know, Hmong was uh, released. And then uh, during the whole hours of live broadcasting, all these factors has been highlighted. First, first of all, Meng was on an Air China plane. This is a government chartered airplane. Okay, this is not a normal commercial airplane. And B, you know, accompanied by uh, the Chinese ambassador in Canada, uh, Tsong Pei Wu, who is on board or fly back from Vancouver to, to Shenzhen all the way. And then upon the arrival, when Meng Wanzhou stepped out of the airplane and delivered a speech, and she opened the speech by, by you know, saying something like, thanks for the motherland. And also he addressed uh, uh, Ambassador Tsong. He addressed uh, the uh, deputy Guangdong governor and the Shenzhen mayor on sites. He didn't, you know, address to the family members. Uh, the husband is among the, the welcoming crowd, but uh, she apparently didn't, you know, say, oh, happy you're here. That's not the message. The message is like, thanks to the government, thanks to the state, I'm now safely back in the motherland. And this is a... This is the whole like the narrative about the Moon case. So it's not actually related even to uh, the two Michaels being released. You know, from the in, on Saturday, there's nothing 
really nothing uh, from the state media about this, and not not even a highlight of Huawei factoring. Like uh, Huawei has hired this uh, uh, you know very expensive lawyer team has been fighting this extradition bill in uh, Canada and also having lots of uh, um, uh, you know behind the curtain talks in the United States. All these facts are are sidelined are, are not mentioned. And interestingly, even uh, Ren Zhengfei was quite um, uh, muted over the return of uh, uh, his daughter. You know, we all know that Meng is still officially the CFO of uh, Huawei, but Huawei just issued a very brief statement and barely mentioned anything about like the future arrangements. And then Ren, uh, to this day, I think he still uh, hasn't made any public comments about um, the return of uh, uh, his beloved daughter. So just to clarify for our listeners who haven't been following this story very closely, Ren Zhengfei is uh, Moan Zhou's father and also the founder of Huawei. But he didn't make a comment after uh, Moan Zhou landed in China. Uh, but has he made any comment about this whole situation in the past? Ren is an extraordinary entrepreneur and uh, and he really uh, didn't like say t- way too much things about the, the whereabouts uh, or well-being about uh, his daughter. And on the only on the record uh, message, I think one or two years ago, when he did this uh, public interview, he said, "You know, I'm prepared that I." not going to see my daughter for a very long, long period of time. I mean, he, he is not the, the kind of man that is crying, you know, oh, you have to give my daughter back. These, these things never happen to, uh, to Ren. And uh, Ren has really been an extraordinary man and stay cool in this whole uh, uh, saga. So Ms. Moan Zhou is still the chief financial officer for Huawei. Uh, but what lies ahead for Huawei now? Well, that's, uh, uh, that's a very, very good question because... Um, you know, the, the Huawei is a different company now, basically, from the moment when uh, Meng was uh, uh, detained at uh, the Vancouver airport in December 2018. You know, by that time, this is a, this is a company apparently on the rise. Uh, and uh, uh, there were some, you know, boasts or, or uh, statements, uh, ambitions, saying, you know, Huawei is going to uh, be the number one in terms of a smartphone market. You know, Huawei is going to beat Samsung, it's going to beat Apple, and, and and it seems like Huawei is, uh, was unstoppable by that time. But, you know, a lot of water has uh, uh, flowed under that bridge ever since. And in the last year, three years, as we all know, the U.S. as a Trump administration has escalated sanction uh, against Huawei and basically deprived the company uh, the access to uh, advanced chips, which is vital to make uh, high-end phones like iPhone 13. So we, we can see that you know, the, the market share of Huawei in the smartphone market plunged very quickly. It is, an, it is from a very powerful player to, uh, to almost like not relevant in, uh, in these days. And so Huawei is trying very hard to find new sources of revenue and profits, of course. And one area is uh, applying 5G into different kind of um, scenarios like mining. Uh, like hospital. And then, of course, it is also uh, trying to develop more like software services, uh, clouding, uh, uh, auto driving, all these things. But these areas are not very, very, say, traditionally fits uh, Huawei's uh, um, capabilities because Huawei is a uh, is hard, hardware uh, equipment maker and all these things more involved with uh, um, uh, software and and services. And Huawei is still a formidable company, of course. It has its resources, it has its talents. But it's, uh, uh, how, how to put it, it's it's kind of like it's entering into areas uh, that even Huawei itself has no certainty that it will be successful. So when uh, Meng Wanzhou returned, it's, of course, in terms of business, uh, if she continues the role as uh, chief financial officer, she will look at the uh, accounting books and finds like the profits have been shrunk and uh, the uh, revenues growth has been slowed significantly. So it's not a very pleasant picture to look at for a chief financial officer. And uh, more importantly, of course, people will care about uh, the power structure of, uh, of of Huawei because Huawei has this unique kind of governance structure. You know, uh, Ren is, uh, is an undisputed you know, final decision maker and the spiritual leader of this uh, business conglomerates. But at the same time, he, he is also kind of detached from day-to-day management and leaving these decisions to the board of directors, which has this rotating chairman. You know, you've been chairman for a few months and then there's another chairman. So uh, all... All eyes are on Huawei now is saying, maybe it's a little bit too early to speculate on that, but like how the return of uh, Meng Wanzhou is going to change this uh, 
uh, governance structure of Huawei. Maybe there's no change. Maybe there, maybe there will be some change. So it's all very, uh, very interesting, yes. And Joseon, what's the broader context and the long game here? What are your sources telling you about the, this ongoing tech war and the diplomatic tensions between the U.S. and China? Well, I think the, the release of Mo and Zhe is certainly a, a very positive sign for the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, it is one of the many uh, positive signs in the, recent, uh, in the last couple of weeks, as we've seen, uh, you know, these two uh, Amer- American Yankees uh, were also allowed to return to to, to U.S. And there, there are lots of speculations that must be something going on between uh, Beijing and Washington, and they may be there laying grounds for um for additional talks or for even more uh, concrete cooperations. And this is one side. But this is our, our kind of like short-term improvement. I mean, in, over, the, over the long run, uh, the rivalry between China and the U.S. Uh, for uh, not only in technology, but also in uh, geopolitical influence uh, in, term, in terms of economy, I think this competition will go on for, forever. But for both sides, they don't want this competition to be, uh, to be out of control, let's say. And also to be in a very uh, uh, chaotic way uh, that neither side wants to wants to see. So um, Long is freed, but the trouble for Huawei is not over. I don't think the uh, Washington will completely lift all the sanctions against Huawei, saying it's okay now for you to buy all the technologies you want to buy, or you can uh, again to sign this uh, contract with TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Process to make your uh, the chips that you designed i think this is still uh, not on the on the, on the table and uh, as we can as we can see you know the, um, uh, the 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 federal administration in the us is 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 still kind of de huawei uh, campaign is still going on asking all the telecom carriers to uh, replace huawei equipment and the government will provide even subsidies to 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 that so you can see that uh, this this Broader power struggle is going on, but of course, yes, we as we can see that from the release of Meng and from all these uh, positive signs in recent weeks, you we can see that it's not at least it's not uh, escalating too quickly. That is uh, to an out of control situation. Great, thanks for your time, Josin. Thanks, Jimmy. That's all for this week's Inside China. And a note to you that while this three-year-long story was in some ways resolved this week, there is so much more to learn about what really happened. And a reminder that you can find the video reports from the airport of Meng Wanzhou's immensely popular return to Shenzhen, the analysis of what happened and opinion pieces on the broader impact of what's been labeled hostage diplomacy on our website at cmp.com. Also a reminder that you can go back to our December episode of Inside China to hear Ian Yang talking about the revelations he reported from the courtroom, as well as the revelations he uncovered while standing in front of Meng Wanzhou's million-dollar mansion in Vancouver. But I'll leave you with these thoughts from Ian, who led the world media coverage of Meng Wanzhou's extradition court case and has spent the last couple of days filing a huge pile of documents he's gathered over the past three years. And there's so much stuff, you know, I've got tens of thousands of pages of documents, all kinds of amazing things that we just didn't have time to cover properly in the, in the daily coverage, even though I wrote 130 stories on it. It's amazing that when, when you're covering it as a court case, you're distilling, you're distilling hours and hours of testimony into, into a thousand words. It's actually not as easy as it sounds, you know, it's, it's quite difficult. And you miss and you fail to report really interesting, significant things. What I want to go back to is the events that led up to her being arrested. You know, the 24 hours, it was really fascinating to me, the 24 hours before she was arrested, when she was in the air flying from Hong Kong to Vancouver, and she was oblivious to all this. She had no idea what was about to happen. There were all these machinations going on. And it was interesting that it was happening at a very low level. Individual police constables here in Vancouver were making decisions that would be dissected minutely in court and would reverberate in Washington and Beijing. You know, it was that that unusual. We had like the, the they were deciding how to arrest her, you know, during on their coffee breaks, you know, and things like that. And so that, that stuff's all really, really interesting. And the details about how she was living here, I don't think we ever really properly got into that either, you know, so I'm glad we covered some of that here. There's so much more to learn, there's so much more to discover, and there's so much more to talk about inside China. Thanks for listening. 
And if you're hearing this on Thursday, September 30, happy International Podcasting Day from all of us here in Hong Kong. My name is Xin Mei Shen. Bye for now.